everybody, and so we got a lot to talk about. The State of the Union was the main item in the news over the course of the last few days. Uh, and then, of course, um, prior to that, the House of Representatives once again uh, put itself on the front page of the nation's newspapers and cable news and internet news with a resolution condemning socialism in every imaginable stripe, uh, claiming that we will never, ever, ever, well, we'll talk more about it in just a moment. Uh, and then also uh, this week, there was a terrible, terrible earthquake in uh, Turkey and Syria, uh, and we'll be uh, addressing uh, that issue. But uh, first, the State of the Union, uh, Scott's favorite president, Mr. <laughs> Biden. Uh, he is my he favorite current president, president of the United States. Appeared in the House of Representatives. I mean, he's your homeboy. What you want me to say? Appeared at the, in the House of And by all accounts, Rosanna, he gave a you know, good speech. He was light on his feet. Could have been Fred Astaire, uh, Muhammad Ali dancing and throwing jabs at the Republicans. And I know Anita was excited about it, but what do you think? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I was thinking that this is the moment that our Marxist analysis, our, our application of our science is really important because we don't, you know, I don't agree with foreign policy, I think it's atrocious. But some of the things that he was saying in terms of what's best for the working class, what's going to benefit the working class is really, is, it, we should support uh, the, uh, the infrastructure, the, the um, police brutality, uh, doing something about that and uh, the cleaning, cleaning up of our environment and the many things that benefited, that benefit our working class I totally agree with um, his uh, attack on the on the extreme right. Although it wasn't on the fascist, wasn't you know really really sharp, but it still was notable. But so I think you know in our science we want to break things up and look at them objectively, and then be able to to make determinations into how we we're gonna what's our next strategy, how we're gonna move forward, and it's important because we want to just generalize. Uh, one thing we, you know, we, I don't agree with his foreign policy, but that doesn't mean that I cannot agree with some of the things that would benefit and be able to po be able to uh, point out the uh, what benefits the working class as a whole that he is trying to do and how we can support those efforts as well. So you know, our science helps us to to break up these things in in small component parts and then be able to put them together in an objective way so that we can make a determination of our next steps uh, towards building this road towards socialism. Well, uh, Anita, uh, Rosanna is calling for an objective analysis. Look at the whole first. So, A, you're a former college professor. A, B, C, D, or F for the president's speech. Anita? I give, well, <laughs> I give him a, um... I give him a B, but I, I think there were some some A minus aspects to the speech, and I agree with uh, Rosanna wholeheartedly that the his foreign policy is awful, and that was a very tiny part of this speech compared with um, states states of the union speeches in the past. Um, so that might be why I like it. But one of the things that I thought was excellent about it, and that really speaks to what Rosanna said about you know benefiting the working class, is the attention to labor in this um, in this speech. The highlighting of the iron worker who's going to be working on this bridge in um, in uh, over the Ohio River um, between Kentucky and Ohio. Um, and uh, and just a number of things about labor he brought in numerous times. He also mentioned um, people who have felt neglected for the last 40 years. And I had to think, well, what was 40 years ago? It was the Ronald Reagan administration, which really started the process of the downhill, you know, the, the real attacks on organized uh, organized labor. 
So I think, I mean, I, I thought it was great if from an Ohio point of view, it was, um, you know, we really felt like he was talking about us. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I thought there was a lot in the speech to like, and I was glad there wasn't much on foreign policy. Scott, A, B, C, D, F. Um, I'm not sure if I'm grading the speech or if I'm grading the presidency or, or, or the whole, you know, of the liberal bourgeoisie or what. So I'm not even going to give a, a letter grade. I think there was some, you know, I agree with it with Rosanna and Anita. Okay, pass or fail. <laughs> What's that? Pass or fail. You don't want to give it a, a, a letter grade. And he's still the president. I don't know if I could, if I could foul him and appoint somebody else, I guess I probably would, but, um, <laughs> No, I think that there was there was really some some excellent stuff. I, I love that he, you know, challenged the Republicans to live up to their word on on not cutting Social Security and Medicare, on really firming up those programs. I think that's great, and I hope they, I hope they rise to the challenge. But I hope they will. Um, I love that he that he explicitly over and over again talked about raising taxes on the wealthy and corporations um, uh, to as a way of of managing. Uh, the deficit, uh, rather than, you know, cutting social welfare programs, that's great. But I think we also have to be very um, cognizant of uh, the fact that all of these priorities he's laying out are impossible as long as the current foreign policy continues. Because even with a substantial raise in taxes on corporations, um, you know, with an $850 billion a year military budget, and that doesn't I don't think, by the way, include the the extra appropriations every month for Ukraine. Um, you know, we're not going to have the money to um, make the kind of advances that he's talking about. Um, and I was also kind of taken aback in his discussion of China when he said, "We want competition, not conflict." My immediate thought was, you know, what about cooperation? Right. What about, you know, a world where um, it's not just we single out a couple of things that might be of mutual benefit, like action on climate, but we actively look for programs that are consistently of mutual benefit, um, you know, as and that goes hand in hand with with reducing the military budget, with scaling back the war machine, uh, the imperialism and, and getting rid of this this aggressive. Um, chauvinist foreign policy and the, the kind of jingoistic presentation of it. Well, you know, there's another part of it. None of that stuff is going to be possible to pass as long as you have a Republican right wing majority in the in the House. I mean, keep in mind, there is no such thing as a uh, soft, moderate Republican. They're all sharply to the right. And even the so-called moderate voted for McCarthy uh, for the Speaker of the House. And that's what the country is up against. Which brings me to my next point. Uh, the president claimed that our democracy remains unbowed and unbroken. Are we living in the same country, Rosanna? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not. At least he, I don't know what country he's living in, but, you know, with the voting rights attack on voting rights, attack on women's rights, attack at all LGBTQ plus rights, uh, in denial of our uh, just ability to live, have a livable wage, all of these kinds of things. Now we're we don't live in a democracy, but he like he wants to convince the American people that we do. And, you know, once again, we always have to dig deeper so that we can know exactly what's what's happening and not be not fall prey to even thinking that uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. is alive. <laughs> Anita, uh, the president said that his economic plan is a blue collar blueprint to rebuild America. You remember that phrase from the uh, uh, speech. Mm -hmm. uh, now, part of what he was arguing for was 
that the infrastructure bill and the uh, chips bill and a number of the legislation that was passed in the previous Congress is starting to be implemented now and over the next two years. Um, and in that effort, the New York Times the other day had a big headline. This is uh, Biden's plan to win back the white working class. I always thought that there was one working class in this country, yeah. not a white one or a black one or a male one or a Latino one, but a single working class organized in the course of the process of production. However, that same article in the Times said that 59% uh, of working class uh, voters in this country say that the Republican Party is the party of the working class. Only 28% said that the Democratic Party is the party of the working class. 68% uh, Anita said that um, more uh, agree more with the Republicans on the economy, 25% with the Democrats, Anita. Claim for the border wall, control uh, over uh, uh, gun control, and and on the idea that it gender is immutable from birth. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, uh, Joe, I, I guess one thing that I would say is we can never really extrapolate to. Uh, strongly from one single poll. It really depends on how they ask those questions and um, and to whom exactly they pose those questions. And I think uh, I think you on polling you'd have to look at the bigger picture. And on a lot of summaries of of uh, you know opinion polls that I've seen on in, that really summarize a lot of different polls, it's the the policies that the Democratic Party has embraced that are really the popular policies. For instance, I mean, we saw that one in the in the um, uh, State of the Union address about Medicare and Social Security. And even though Republicans have come out against those things, um, the, the, the people obviously still want them and the Republicans would like to sweep under the rug their, uh, their, op their um, intentions to sunset uh, those, those programs. So I think, I mean, I, I, I think you can't depend on, on one poll here. And yeah, I think people are, um, have been swayed by uh, the right-wing media, for example, and right-wing radio out here in the, in the countryside. Um, and we have, to, we have to fight against that um, and, and clarify those, those things. But I, I think the working class, working, working class voters are still, um, can be appealed to for their actual interests. And I think, you know, hopefully uh, we can see that happening in the future. Have also, to be appealed to, have to be appealed to, I mean, and not and it, only on economic interests, but also on their uh, cultural interests. And, and that requires a, a fierce, uh, Scott, uh, a development and encouragement and, and, and engagement in, uh, the battle of ideas, but yeah, and it's, uh, but it's also important as part of that battle of ideas to to fight for our definition of the working class because when these polling outfits uh, that that the you know the bourgeois media uses uh, when they talk about the working class they generally mean the most common definition is um, people without a college degree. Um, and sometimes they'll add to that, you know, making less than seventy-five thousand dollars a year, for example, or um, you know, in non-supervisory positions, or you know, various other qualifiers. But um, all of their definitions cut out huge sections of the working class. So imagine, you know, thinking about the working class, but excluding uh, school teachers, excluding nurses, uh, excluding. As is usually done, everybody with a with a college degree that massively changes the picture. Uh, yes, um, it does seem that overall um, voters without a college degree are um, more likely to vote Republican, and that's something that you know 
as Joe said, we need we need to work on, we need to get better about the battle of ideas. But um, when you define out a huge section of the working class, yeah, it's easy to make to make the working class sound reactionary. We think that the majority of the American people are workers, whether they will go to college or not. And that, and that class is not determined by your level of education, but by your relationship to production. Well, on job creation, B plus, on infrastructure investments, another B plus, on lowering costs for drug, B, climate energy, uh, C plus, taxing uh, the corporations and billionaires, I give them another B plus on worker rights. Okay, good. You call for the PRO Act, but I wasn't really happy with what you did with the railway workers, uh, Mr. Biden. Sorry. You know, you're going to have to do better, a whole lot better. And by the way, did you hear that the uh, labor secretary <laughs> got a new job? He's, he's <laughs> left the administration. What is his name? Marty Walsh? He left the he left the administration and now he's going to work for the hockey workers union, hockey players union, uh, uh, to the tune of I think about two million dollars a year. So wow. you know, money talks, bullshit, uh, bullshit walk. <laughs> Can you have um, bipartisanship, <laughs> Rosanna, <clears throat> with these? Right wing people, I, you know, I, I keep stumbling over that issue. You know, we, I mean, I just wonder how you can fight the fascist danger. And it's a real danger, uh, which is why I would take issue with the, our demo I agree with you on our, our democracy remains unbowed and unbroken. Uh, but how you can carry out that fight without naming it for what it is. And you can't cooperate with them because they're not moderates. Am I right or wrong? No, you're right. I think, you know, they, they um, I, I think it's a way to sort of, once again, the propaganda and, and influence people into thinking that that's a possibility. And, you know, it's like a happy ending kind of where you're watching a movie, but it's not, it's a struggle. We have to, certain things have to change, and we, as working people, can make that change. We just have to organize it. And, and the foreign policy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say it again, Rosanna. I interrupted. As, and you. get a, and get off get get off our sofas and and you know into the con members of Congress offices and on the streets and writing letters to editors and just social media, all of that. You got to get out there and raise some hell, in other words. Uh -huh. you know, that, that's what's needed, uh -huh. big time. Well, um, speaking of uh, raising hell, the uh, U.S. House of Representatives last week said that uh, Anita, socialism is hell, and that everybody from Karl Marx to, uh, I guess, Olive Palm, was the what was he the prime minister of Sweden or something like that? I was trying to think of a social democratic, the Mitterrand from France or whoever is the mm -hmm. current president of well, all of them are totalitarian devils, and uh, we will never. What is and 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 half of the Democratic caucus and voted for that thing. I know it was, yeah, it was, it was a ridiculous um, ploy of uh, the Republicans to try to um, split the Democrats uh, uh, and, and, and pit part of the Democratic Party uh, congressional delegation against the other part. Um, and, and are they also talking about Bernie Sanders and Rashida Tlaib and a number of other people, AOC, who who are, you know, embrace the, the concept of democratic socialism. And I think they're really going to, someone made this point, well, our, our producer made this point yesterday that um, it, it, he really let go, uh, they really are, are splitting um, 
the Democratic voters by uh, in, in into age categories. Young uh, Democrats, young people in our society do not have the have the uh, bad guy image of socialists like uh, like the Republicans are trying to promulgate here. And it's Republicans from Southern California, I mean, Southern Florida, who are really behind this uh, big time, who were the sponsors of this uh, legislation. And it seems like Southern uh, Florida is just a, 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 it's just full of anti-communist and anti-socialist rhetoric constantly on the, on the, in the media and the, uh, in the churches here, it's just uh, relentless anti-socialism propaganda. So, not surprising. Well, you know, Miami. I think that the important thing was that eighty-six or whatever the number was, Democrats voted against that resolution. That wouldn't have happened twenty years ago, thirty years ago, you know. But now you got a progressive caucus. You got a lot of people who have the courage to stand up and not go for all that anti-communist nonsense. Scott, at the National Committee meeting a couple of weeks ago, we made the point, we said that Mitch McConnell says that everything to the left of Ronald Reagan is socialist and that the Democratic Center, not to be outdone, equates uh, socialism with author authoritarianism and fascism. And that was you know, what was particularly pathetic for me about um, this was some of the some of the just grandstanding by by so-called moderate uh, Democrats, like uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, trying to um, say that the the insurrectionists who carried tried to carry off a coup on January sixth were socialists because they were against democracy and things like it's just pathetic. Red baiting is um, the 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 age the analysis of, based on age is is entirely right. Um, it just doesn't resonate anymore. And I think the right is beginning to perceive that. So they're doubling down, like they're trying to, you know, get louder and more shrill about it. But it's just, you know, it's a thing of the past. Not, I mean, not that anti-communism is, but uh, the idea that you can just red bait somebody and then write them off, you know, is, it, it doesn't work that way anymore, I don't think. Rosanna, tomorrow, uh, the socialist-minded president of Brazil, Lula, is coming to Washington. Biden's going to be sitting down, shaking hands and breaking bread with, uh, with a uh, worker and class leader that has the Communist Party of Brazil as part of their coalition. You know, these guys are so stuck in the past. And, and they refuse to come to grips with the reality that the point Anita just made, that the rising generation, they don't see socialism as an evil thing. They're more in favor of socialism than capitalism, you know? And so they better get on the right train or they're gonna end up losing a whole lot more elections because people ain't going for that nonsense anymore. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, it's 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 not that they're they're not living in, in the reality. I think it's they, they very much understand what's happening. They very much understand that they're losing control of the minds of the American people and the people of the world. Especially with social media, you can look up anything. What does socialism mean? What is it really what is it really about? Is it, you know, uh, has there really been a communist country? You can ask those questions and and everybody has access to the internet now from, you know, no matter what economic uh, um, status you are, you, there's somebody has a cell phone that you can use, uh, you know, a smartphone that you can look up these things. You can go to the libraries and look up something. So the information is much more readily available so that people can look it up as opposed to just uh, depending on people to tell you or these politicians to tell you what what it, what things are and and they're desperate you know they're desperate they're 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 picking on little things but then on on one end and on the other end they're having to deal with uh socialist minded presidents and uh you know as what's going to happen in, uh, with lula so i think uh you know i agree with scott 
it's not it's 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 a landless battle people are no longer being going to be convinced that this is that socialism is bad i mean you put people before profits period that's all that's all you need <clears throat> put people before profits speaking of which there was a terrible terrible earthquake in uh turkey and syria uh last week tens of thousands dead in the rubble but still as i was watching the news this morning they're still pulling families out of the rubble collapsed buildings uh, but there's a big problem anita sanctions against syria and there were trucks trying to go across the border and they wouldn't let them through you know they're trying to isolate Assad, the president uh, because of the civil war and and uh this sanction policy uh making really not hurting the government as much as it's hurting the people exactly and this happens this happens with cuba when cuba had a destructive hurricane uh situation as well the u.s didn't back down uh until until it did under pressure back down um but yeah the united states has these sanctions in place they're not the most effective uh policy uh they're not they're not giving the united states back what it uh wants and in a humanitarian crisis like this it's just we we should just be there with um all the uh assistance and facilitation that we can Scott, you said cooperation. Well, that's a, a area where the United States could cooperate with every government in the world and providing assistance to the victims of that terrible earthquake. For sure. Take a page from Cuba's book. You know, we export uh, weapons and, and wars. Cuba, uh, Cuba exports doctors. You know, they've got disaster teams ready to go. Um, they they are the world experts in public health and, and disaster management. And that's, and you know, that's their mission to the world. You know, I wish we, I wish our country was more like that. Well, one day we will be. One day we will be. Yeah. That's what the Communist Party is all about. Organizing with other like-minded people on the basis of issues to create a United States of America that works on behalf of the working class and not the big corporations. Um, and But in order to do that, we have got to be able to defeat the most right-wing sections of the, work, of the ruling class uh, in the first place as a step towards defeating the ruling class as a whole. Which brings us to our mailbag question of the week, because some of our readers are wondering if uh, we're analyzing, you know, the ruling class right and understanding its different sections and who's supporting who, who's zooming who. And so the our writer uh, sent us a note in which they asked the following. I recently read through your program. It's a good program. You can find it at cpusa.org. And he said, and we encourage everybody to read it. And he said, I saw a lot of mention of certain transnationals, weapons, oil, energy, big tech, finance, capital. That means banks, by the way, big manufacturers being part of the extreme right. I want to know one thing which corporations are not part of the extreme right and how can you tell how does this relate to the party's anti-monopoly strategy that's a tough question who wants to take a shot oh well, i'll take a stab real quick um ah, knife in hand <laughs> go ahead uh, ah, you know, uh, I, I believe so we um you know, we should start by saying that there's no section of the capitalist class uh, that can be counted as a consistent, you know, ally of the working class. There's no corporation that is, you know, a consistent ally of the working class and the, and the people. Um, that said, you know, in certain cases, um, you know, look at the, the fight between um, Disney and the ultra right wing 
government in Florida uh, over um, LGBTQ rights, or look at the split in um, among certain investment firms among uh, what are called environmental, social, and governance goals, um, which which mean basically trying to move money toward firms that are um, slightly less destructive, or have, um, you know, at least are trying not to be quite as evil. Uh, and then there's a whole reaction to that among other firms that are, you know, talking about, oh, woke capitalism, woke investing is going to whatever. So there are splits where, where um, these things do happen. Um, but once we get to the anti-monopoly phase, we're no longer going to be thinking about which section of transnational capital uh, will side with the working class because our enemy will be monopoly capital as a whole. Right now in the fight against the extreme right, um, you know, we, we, we do look for those splits and fractures within capital. Anita, Rosanna, I, I mean, Lenin made the argument that, uh, no, Dimitrov, that the fascism was uh, the dictatorship of the most right-wing sections of finance capital. But our gentle reader of the program is saying, I ain't so, so sure about that. Anita, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Um, I think it really helps to to look at not um, not individual corporations and say, you know, this corporation is part of the extreme right and this one isn't. I think instead it it's helpful to look at individual projects that the um, that the uh, corporation is undertaking. Uh, for example, uh, General Electric during the period of that those last this last four decades, just the the the, the steps they took. And including uh, really in, engrossing themselves in finance capital um, and also just taking anti-labor steps and other projects that really uh, fit into the, the far right uh, section of the ruling class. So I think looking at, at uh, corporations' individual actions and, and evaluating their impact on the unity of the, of the working class and the, the chance for organization of that class. But, 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 Rosanna, there were about 100 corporations after January the 6th. And we ain't giving no more money to the Republicans anymore. That lasted about two seconds. I'm mm -hmm. talking about big ones. Walmart, Home Depot, <laughs> you know. And, and now the, the, the floodgates are open. And um, doesn't that tell us something? Sure, we can't count on them. <laughs> that they are, <laughs> you know, it's it's all. Um, you know, we have a Spanish term for that. It's called pura lengua, which means it's just all a bunch of blah 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 blah. <laughs> you, you know, stuff that is not going to make any sense. Uh, or, but you know, and, and we just have to be very vigilant and and really look at things in a way that uh, it, it, with the working class in mind always and what is best for the working class. And that's how we make our decisions about what, which, we, which ones we support and which ones are and where. And, you know, it's a lot about propaganda and trying to change people's thinking about or framing people's thinking. And we've got to be very mindful of that happening and try to fight against it and making sure that we're thinking for ourselves and, and what's best for the working class as a whole. The big capital has always played both ends against the uh, mm -hmm. middle, but they have a preference. And, and, and that preference has always historically up to and through the current moment uh, been in favor of the Republican party and the extreme right. Of course, they fund the Dems as well, some of them, uh, but they have a preference and and uh, and it's reflected in what well, you saw it the other day on the State of the Union on all of the issues with respect to taxing the rich and jobs creation and, uh, you know, uh, child tax credit. 
you know, the, the place was split in half, you know. You know, the Republicans were sitting on their thumbs uh, and and the the other, you know, were standing applauding. And that says something about, you know, what their outlook and where their alliances lie. Well, um, thank you for the question. Please keep sending them in. And uh, before we end, there's a birthday celebration today. One of the great playwrights and poets mm -hmm. of uh, the last century, uh, Bertolt Brecht. Today mm -hmm. is his 125th birth. I wish I had a poem of his to read. I, I didn't have enough for it. And, and we were notified about this by one of our watchers and readers. Thank you uh, for letting us know. And we encourage everybody, if something is happening, send us a note so that, uh, so that we can uh, put it on the show and, and talk about it. So happy, happy birthday, Bertolt Brecht, 125 today. Um, and if you have a moment, put his, put his name in your browser and read one of his uh, great poems or plays. Well, that does it for the week. Uh, Rosanna, Anita, Scott, see you next week. To all of our watchers and friends and comrades, take care, stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.